well, hello everyone. Uh, again, my, my name is Anders Kotans. I'm uh, the president of the Alumni Association and welcome back to the, uh, the discussion afternoon uh, where we are uh, attempting to seek for new growth uh, vectors uh, for the Baltics. We had a wonderful session uh, before this on, uh, on, on, uh, from a macroeconomic perspective. We explored what the EU programs and local government policies, uh, what opportunities those might bring. And uh, now it's time to go uh, more microeconomic, uh, to stretch, stretch the skin on a corporate and industry level. And uh, to do that, uh, to guide that discussion, we've asked um, uh, a faculty member, uh, a very uh, trained person from uh, various leading business schools across the world in uh, the field of strategy, uh, which uh, this really is about, uh, Yuri Romanenkov, who is the, the executive vice president of SSC Riga. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, and I look forward for an interesting discussion. Andres, thank you for this um, very flattering introduction. Um, we are, I'll let you switch off the sound. Brilliant. Um, so, Andres, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, we're obviously, um, those of you who tuned in to the last session uh, will have heard, um, you know, central bankers and politicians talk about all of these sort of millions and billions of euros in some countries, trillions, you know, deal with all of these, you know, very uh, high level things on paper. So I'm sort of really pleased that we, in addition to that, which is also obviously very important, we also have a, an opportunity this afternoon uh, to really get um, considerably more pragmatic and, you know, and considerably more down to earth. Uh, with that, you know, I'm a strategy professor here, so I guess uh, I mean, people would not generally accuse me of being too pragmatic. You know, most people think the strategy professors are very, uh, very conceptual. Uh, but I do think that we can have a, a really hands on sort of practical debate this afternoon on how to win in this very strange world. So and we're really privileged to have, uh, you know, people who are very much on the front line of, um, of this debate and who make decisions either as business leaders or as investors uh, to, to basically figure out, you know, how do you win um, uh, today? So um, I am delighted that we've got, uh, you know, we've got Martin Gauss, uh, the chairman and chief executive officer of Air Baltic with us this afternoon. Uh, we've got Edgar Sesemann, the, the chief executive officer of Rimi Baltic. Uh, we've got um, uh, Martin Schmarnauser, one of our alumni um, and the partner at Color Capital, a global private equity firm. Um, and then we've got uh, Tavi Einas, the partner at Nortal, um, a tech business that supports digitalization of businesses around Europe. So all sorts of different perspectives that could really uh, try to help us work out, uh, you know, how, um, again, how we ultimately, the question of this session is, is how can we continue to win? Because, of course, if you take a big step back and you think about what crises create, crises tend to widen the gap between winners and losers. So uh, we'll try to figure out together and get everyone's views on, uh, you know, who, uh, you know, how do you win when you have headwinds facing you? And then equally, how do you stay ahead of the curve where you've got, uh, where you've got a tailwind uh, potentially facing you? If you're in a great industry, uh, but you know, everyone's doing well, how do you make sure that you still emerge out, um, out in the front? So the way we're gonna do it is <clears throat> we're going to uh, get the perspectives of our speakers first, I'm going to um, um, ask them a few questions in turn, um, get their perspectives. Uh, we'll then have a little bit of a debate, um, I guess, uh, within this group, um, at which point we will open it to broader questions. So please do feel free to submit questions to us. Uh, you know, um, I will see the questions um, here on this laptop um, and we'll be able to put them uh, to the speakers, uh, you know, in the second, uh, second chapter, shall we say, um, of, this, uh, of this session. So uh, with that, I think um, what I, where I'd like to start is maybe I'd like to start uh, with, uh, with you, uh, Martin Gauss. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We know you have quite a lot on your plate, like everyone on this call. Um, and maybe, maybe just for all of our audience's context, it will probably come to no, so, as no surprise to anyone that you know, in the best times, um, airlines, your industry, is not exactly a very easy industry to operate in. Um, right, you know, you've had, um, you know, whether you're in, in Europe or whether you're in North America, uh, you know, it's an incredibly competitive business with a lot of fixed cost, uh, you know, with um, therefore creating all sorts of strategic uh, 
uh, complications for just about in just about every possible way. In the US, they go bankrupt all the time, as we know, over the past decades. So very, very tough, arguably one of the toughest uh, businesses in any time. And now, of course, you know, with all of the craziness that's going on around the world, arguably, you know, one of the most affected uh, industry. So the, the latest uh, latest analysis from uh, from our colleagues at McKinsey points out that airlines is the second worst affected industry by COVID-19 after your suppliers, uh, the likes of Boeing and Airbus in the in the aerospace industry. So I guess my my question to you to start with is, is how do you see this industry evolving? You know, how do you I mean, now that we see passenger numbers down by 80 percent in September in Europe, you know, you have some of your colleagues in the United States, for example, you know, Ed Bastian, the CEO of Delta, says that we're never going to see uh, the business traveler numbers, for example, like we saw in 2019. Um, what are your views on this? You know, where are we really going and how is this going to evolve from here? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, uh, first of all, I do not share my colleagues view uh, that we will not see the passenger numbers again on business travel because we are now this year a hundred years old industry. I agree we were not uh, the industry which had it too easy, but if we look at Air Baltic, for example, before that uh, pandemic, we were uh, celebrated for going from record to record and uh, growing and uh, um, nothing uh, stopping us to grow again after the pandemic. Um, if you look at the biggest airline in the world, still Lufthansa, they yesterday reported a 5.6 billion loss in the first nine months, a company which last year made billions of profit. So we have a very, very um, um, individual situation in this pandemic in our industry. We're the second after Airbus and Boeing, the second most hit. Where do we go from here? Of course, there will be some time needed. First of all, the pandemic needs to be under control. Then we will all, the ones who are still there, uh, recover. Uh, we, first, we need to stay. That's what, what uh, all of us do now with the help of our shareholders. In Europe, most of the time, the governments are bailing out the airlines or bridging, let's say, not bailing them out, bri bridging the cash flow until airlines are back to earn their cash flow because we are earning cash flow if we can fly. And that, I think, is something which is not understood. If we look at China, China is, from a capacity point of view, now back uh, at the old levels. They have the same capacity on domestic travel than they had before the pandemic uh, and they have dealt with the pandemic in a different way so we will see passenger numbers higher than in 2019 in the future but it will be very different and different players will exit uh, but we will also then see others uh, winners of this crisis because they might have set up themselves better and in, in the case of air baltic uh, you could say we were lucky but i think we did the right things in the last seven years when uh, the airline was put on a track that we wanted to have the most modern aircraft and environmental friendly aircraft. Uh, we were sorting out our financial situation. Uh, we, we issued a bond uh, for the reason that we could grow and buy new aircraft. That was good because at that time uh, we had the money already. Now our shareholders said, okay, we want you to go into the future. And uh, we got uh, for Latvian perspective, a very high equity injection. So we are set up uh, we have a burn rate, we will make losses, but we are set up to go even if we would not fly, um, if we would stop the airline now. We controlled our cost uh, to an extent that we can go for more than one year from now, not flying and still paying all our bills. So what we do now, we prepare for the restart and of course, uh, uh, then see ourselves again as a winner. So, Martin, this is very helpful. Um, and I'm wondering, building on what you're saying, you mentioned um, that, you know, a number of players will um, exit the market. Uh, you know, do you basically um, expect a wave of bankruptcies in the sector in the next, be it, you know, 12 months, let's say in Europe or in any other region of the world? And what are the implications of that in your view? Um, yes, we will see that. But of course, as all the governments want to maintain their air infrastructure, and there's a good reason for that. Nobody would question the road systems in a country. Nobody would say, okay, let's not rebuild it if it is damaged. And what happened here, not the airlines were responsible that they are not at the moment providing the connectivity. The pandemic is responsible for it. And therefore the states, all the states try to maintain their infrastructure. Uh, that means the ones who will not be there anymore are the ones who were not... Um, 
not needed, let's say, where, where the governments, the different governments, especially in Europe, said, okay, this is not needed anymore. But we are, we're looking now at many, many different countries. And if we look at the Baltics, we have a unique situation or a lucky situation for Air Baltic. We are the market leader in all three Baltic countries, but we are only owned by one government, the Latvian government. And the Latvian government alone has said, we want to maintain that air infrastructure, which is vital for the Baltics. Why is it vital? Because if we look at Slovenia, there was a report yesterday that Ljubljana airport had zero departures, zero air connectivity on a day. And then today, I think they have two departures. The connectivity, which is not provided anymore by airlines, will lead in the long term to um, an economic uh, impact. In, in the case of Air Baltic, many studies have been there that the aviation sector in Latvia alone, we are contributing 3% of the GDP. I understand now that everybody says, don't fly, don't fly, because there's the pandemic and uh, maybe some other priorities, which I really see. But if we want to come back, then aviation uh, is important. And you see the efforts in Germany on Lufthansa, 9 billion have been provided in the first tranche to Lufthansa and very likely there will be a second tranche coming now because they want to ensure co air connectivity. So uh, I would say, see, see the airline industry as, an, as a connectivity and who will leave the field, uh, we will see next spring because then the winter is over. And when, when we all start again, then we will see the difference. But I don't want to make a prognosis which of the airlines will not be there anymore. Of course, I'm, I would not be tempted to ask you about specific names. But then thinking more broadly about the industry and, for example, the, the volumes and the capacity, uh, what would be your perspective? Um, again, you mentioned that, that you think it is going to recover. You know, we think connectivity is important, which I think is what we all acknowledge. Do you almost see, um, you know, if I turn on my inner Michael Porter, do you see, for example, digital meetings like what we're having right now as, you know, a long term meaningful substitute for business travel? Um, or do you think that, um, you know, we might um, in, let's say, five years or a longer period recover to the, the business travel numbers that we've seen perhaps over the past decade? We, we will definitely recover and we will see higher numbers. Uh, the IATA, uh, the, the World Aviation Association, is uh, not reporting that we won't see this. And I think nobody in the 100 years of aviation would think that we will not connect more with each other. But the digitalization, which we see now, it's very important because it can filter out unnecessary travel. Uh, and we all do this every day now. We see what works, but we also see what doesn't work. And there's lots of comedies now about all these online meetings. And we all know the limitations of online meetings. If you look at the participation of uh, bigger congresses and you look at the participation of the same in online, you can tell the difference already. Also, there is behind uh, all the events which are online, when it's public events, there is a whole chain. It's not just the people coming. There's a catering industry behind it media industry and so on. So uh, people want to meet in person and in our business, a lot of the bigger discussions we have, you have to do them face to face. You're not, uh, you're not uh, signing an aircraft deal as we did uh, worth several billion. You're not doing this over a Skype conference. You will over time, it's, it's a long process, you will meet in person. But also small and medium sized businesses will need, want to make um, the deal and then the difference will be one company says we can do it all online and another company says no I'm going to send my guy over to do the business himself and then he might win and that will lead automatically to the others to say okay I lost three now I want to make one I sent my person over so it will return but for that first pandemic has to go second we have to have the companies uh, in, a, in a shape that they can afford travel and then, of course, the willingness of the individual. So business travel will take longer. Private travel will really, really, really go fast because everybody now sitting nearly for a year and hasn't flown. There is a, a, a strong backlog of people who want to spend money. We see this from the surveys we do with our customers, uh, especially the, the frequent travelers. They are really keen to fly out and have a break and do something in their free time. So we will see that returning very fast business travel a year later. So this is, this is a very interesting perspective, Martin, in terms of the mix of business and leisure travel, and you saying that business is going to come back maybe a bit later. So what I wanted to explore in terms of industry structure and in terms of, you know, the different strategies that different airlines pursue, um, obviously some of them perhaps are a little bit more reliant on, um, on business travelers. I mean, I'm sure, you know, the example that you use, Lufthansa, um, who um, have, you know, 
build propositions that are industry leading for business travelers. Um, you know, the various cabins that they operate um, domestically, Europe wide, and then, and then uh, transcontinental versus, you know, the low cost players like the Ryanair's and the easy jets of this world who perhaps um, carry some business travelers, but perhaps lower proportionally. Um, in light of that, you know, do you see that the industry structure between these different types of players or types of strategies, if you will, do you see it sort of taking a step change or some sort of a seismic shift um, as a result? Or do you think that we're going to, again, get back to more or less where we were before? Uh, no, I, I see that change and you see it already now, because if we look at players like Lufthansa, they have to, after the crisis, and they're doing it already now, speed up because the segment which Ryanair and, and Vizier and EasyJet is, is having in Europe was growing faster and they were losing market share to these players. So these players also with their very favorable balance sheets and good cash positions will be coming out stronger uh, and the others will have to follow. The business segment, uh, there will be a big difference between long haul and short haul. I'm pretty sure that the, the large carriers will make again their money on long haul business travel. While on short haul, uh, I think we see more and more a shift to low cost carriers. You will travel for business, but you will do it cost conscious. And, and do you think that, you know, that obviously now that we're um, in, in a world where, you know, passenger numbers are 80% down in Europe in September, I'm told, you know, the, the likes of the Wizz Airs and the Ryanairs of this world that rely a lot on leisure travelers, they've obviously got fairly healthy balance sheets, but will, you know, will, how much damage will they have to sustain and will that lead to maybe a reduced capacity in low cost or you think that they will be able to maintain their capacity for the, for the medium to long term and bounce back really quickly? No, everybody is now adjusting capacity. In Air Baltic's case, we adjusted in March. We couldn't fly for two months and we are in Europe as Air Baltic hit harder than any other airline because uh, the Latvia each Friday issues a no-fly list, let's say, and uh, that is not the case for other airlines in Europe. So we have taken out so much capacity and we cannot bring it all back in the year 2020. We do believe we will have the same capacity in 2021. And uh, listening to Visa and Ryanair, they see it similar. So they don't see all the capacity coming back next year, but then in 2021. And of course, all of them have uh, big aircraft orders and uh, nobody uh, yet is canceling his orders for the future. That is also something the market shows you. If you look around the globe, the orders for the future are not canceled. What is happening right now is renegotiating of existing deliveries, but the long-term orders uh, are not touched because everybody believes that this vital infrastructure is returning. Yeah, it's just a question now when we're in the peak of the pandemic, you will not find a lot of people to give you a very good outlook now, but uh, we, we will see, uh, let spring come, um, a better control of the pandemic and we will see the aviation industry having a very, very nice uh, upturn. Right. And then maybe maybe uh, looking a little bit at the, the role of government that you touched on a number of times here. You know, the, the government obviously plays multiple roles with respect to your industry as a regulator. Now as a regulator telling you where you are and aren't able to operate. Uh, but also, like you mentioned, you no know, financing provider, both in the case of Air Baltic, in the case of Lufthansa. Um, but do you feel, um, what is your view on the role of government um, in, this, in this situation, specifically with respect to airlines? How uh, do we make sure that they don't engage in sort of picking the winners uh, for, for the rest of the industry, which is the, the picture that perhaps, uh, you know, your, your colleagues in the low cost sector um, are painting by saying, you know, uh, Lufthansa gets all of these bailouts that you were referring to, to take it, uh, take it across uh, across the edge, um, but uh, but not as much uh, some of the low cost players. What is your uh, sort of thought? What are your thoughts on the role of government with respect to that? Uh, to my knowledge, there is no airline, including Ryanair, which has not uh, got money uh, in form of a loan. Also, Ryanair has taken a, a credit facility from the UK government. So, uh, all airlines are relying on government in one form or the other. Of course, governments will protect their national carriers, first of all, because they want, to they want to maintain their individual air infrastructure. And the countries which do not have an own airline anymore, they are now suffering, like uh, Slovenia as an example. But also just imagine, we would not be flying to Tallinn or Vilnius, then these two countries would have a massive impact because others are just not uh, stepping in. So the, connect the governments which have an airline will provide help to that airline because they want to maintain the infrastructure. And the EU, with, as a regulator, uh, with their procedures, makes sure that that is all done in a 
way that uh, it is not against competition because all the help uh, each of the airlines is allowed to have, including Air Baltic, has to be repaid to the government. So we have, that's the reason why we're going for an IPO because we have to repay in a certain amount of time the equity which was put in and the same applies to the others. So it's not for free. The airlines have to give the money back and we are able to give it back because once we are producing cash flows again, uh, airlines will return to uh, profitability, the ones who will be there and then we will be able to repay it. But the government, uh, without the government, the airlines wouldn't be flying anymore. Right. And then, and then, Martin, if we take a, a step back um, and sort of get back to some of the original questions of, you know, now that we've, you've set all of this context and we think about, you know, the next 10 years in, uh, in the airlines industry, what does it take to win? So what kind of strategic levers you at Air Baltic are looking to pull? And perhaps you would think that your colleagues, CEOs of other airlines in Europe and worldwide would be pulling to sort of in this very competitive industry, in this very damaged industry by COVID to really stay ahead of the pack. As we have very different business models around the globe, and then we have three different, um, so we have North America where consolidation has taken place a while ago. So they're a little bit ahead. We have Asia, which is booming because just of the population and, and the, the wealth booming faster than here. And we have a fragmented Europe, fragmented in anything, not only uh, airlines, also the air infrastructure and also the airports. But what, what we will see here and, and us as a winner now, sustainability is going to be the key word for our industry once that pandemic is over. Uh, there was a lot of it uh, done before that pandemic. Now, of course, uh, that word is not there anymore. This will be, the winners will be the ones who can deal with their cost levels, invest in modern aircraft and, and tell the flying public that what they are doing is more sustainable than it was before. You need to have your cost under control and a lot of the low cost airlines did that. The big ones are trying to do it, but you have to show to the flying public that you are doing it sustainable. And uh, for us, the winning concept will be to focus on sustainability, not only when the crisis is over, we did it by, uh, we, are, we are flying the most modern aircraft in the world at the moment or the greenest aircraft. And that was a good, uh, good investment before the crisis because it will pay off after the crisis. And if we look at the announcement of Air France, they would like to bring forward their order for the aircraft, which we already fly. So everybody wants to have now an aircraft which has a lower CO2, lower fuel flow. Uh, therefore, the winners, or, or, yeah, the winners will be the ones who can control their cost, which I think a lot of airlines can do now, and then have also addressed the sustainability. Um, and I think we will see that, but only when the pandemic is over. Right. And then if I, if I maybe broaden this a little bit, and, you know, we've obviously got viewers right now, um, you know, our alumni uh, from all sorts of different industries, um, you know, what do you, you know, if, if we try to extrapolate some of these lessons, you talked about sustainability, you talked about cost control, are these or are there any other lessons that you would share from your experience of managing in this tough time uh, with leaders in other industries? You know, what kind of what kind of message do you have for them in terms of, you know, what should they be thinking about in terms of the, the levers to win? Uh, definitely you should, when you're faced with a crisis, uh, you should uh, make sure if you run a company that you stay because uh, a lot of people are doing all sorts of plans, but they forget the first thing you have to make sure if you're hit in crisis, that you stay, whatever is needed, uh, get fresh equity, uh, reduce your costs, do all these things. Then you need to adjust because after the crisis, it will not be the same than before. But in, in the crisis, you should have a vision for your people to where, where to go to. Because if you don't know where you want to go to after the crisis, it will be very difficult. And once you have that, uh, I can only recommend to be ready like for a Formula One start. Um, because once a crisis is over, the race starts and you should be ready for that. But key in the crisis is stay by all means, because everything else I said, you're not allowed to do if you failed to stay. So Air Baltic is staying, or we, we, we made sure because we got uh, our shareholders to agree to that. We have revised our product. We have only one uh, sustainable aircraft type now. Uh, we are not flying anything else anymore. We are now with all of our staff ready trained, uh, seeing these lights in front of us at the Formula One start. And all we are waiting for is that pandemic to be over and then off we go. 
Marcia, I think we're all, I really love the Formula One analogy. I think we're all looking forward to this, the start time. Uh, so thank you for these perspectives. We'll get back to you later on in our discussion. Uh, but I now want to turn to, uh, to uh, your colleague at Rimi Baltic, Edgar Sesemann, right here with us. Edgar, you're in a, uh, a fairly radically different place, I think, from, uh, from Martin Gauss. You know, people can not go on holiday or people can not go to a business trip, but people cannot people need to eat and people need to brush their teeth um, and people need to wash their clothes. So in a way, you know, as a, as a grocery retailer, you're in, a, in the opposite, a much more privileged position um, because you've basically, from a value, value creation point, your industry has not really been hit at all and in a way has perhaps won in a number of, uh, from you know, a shareholder return perspective uh, for in, in, in a number of cases. But that said, you know, you still have a lot of challenges in terms of how shopper behavior has has changed and how your operating environment has changed, you know, with obviously now going to a grocery store um, with all your customers wearing masks, with plexiglass um, across the checkout counter, um, all of the groceries being packaged, very, very, very different environment. So what do you think are the most important ways that the industry has transformed since, um, since February this year, really? I think it's a transformation that has been going on that is just speeding up. And of course, e-commerce is the key word, and I will get back to that a little bit. But uh, for us, when the, the COVID hit, of course, there's a lot of things to do. Some stores was increasing 30 40% in sales. Some other stores were decreasing 30 40% in sales. So there were big costs and, and reductions in, in some store, and at the same time, you need to increase in others. We have to work overtime in the warehouse to fulfill everybody's need of toilet paper, which seems to be the most uh, key item when it came to, to, to a crisis situation. But of course, you don't consume more toilet paper if you have it at home. So then afterwards, you get the negative effect of it. So then you need to adjust again. And this adjustment is uh, what we have been doing. So in Q2, we were pretty hit in the result. But in Q3, you are back again. And that is because our industry has so low fixed cost. For every euro you spend in the store, about 60, 60 euro cent goes to the suppliers, 15 to 20 euro cents goes, goes in VAT. And of our cost, of course, ours and, and uh, personnel cost is the highest one. And that you adapt pretty quickly. So we, de we need just a couple of months to be able to adjust our business towards uh, the development in each of the stores. Uh, back to e-commerce, because I think that digitalization and what is happening in our industry is really what is uh, booming. And you can see that in the rest of Europe also. At Remy, we were a little bit uh, slower than our competitors into the market because you need some volume of scale before you go in. And we went in and then COVID came just when we were launching. So we speed up the launching of it in uh, Estonia and Lithuania. And now we are starting to grow and uh, growing rapidly because we see that customers want to go more online when you have the opportunity to get uh, the deliveries to your home. Uh, all the precautions in the stores that we are doing with Pexi glasses and all of that, some, some customers still say, I want to stay at home, shop on the internet. So that is really what is uh, driving a, a huge part of the market growth, I think, for the next coming three, four years. All the growth in the market will be going to the e-commerce. To the e and in the Baltics, if you compare, we are rather low on the e-commerce when it comes to food compared to, I mean, UK is probably the most mature market in, in, in Europe in the e-commerce. Uh, then we also have some effects in the assortment ranges. You can see definitely that uh, home in replacement assortment, etc., is not that attractive any longer. And our sales of canned and frozen food and, and also cigarettes or tobacco seems to be smoking, seems to go up. I don't know if it's because the borders are closed, so we sell the cigarettes today and not in the open markets, maybe. But uh, so there is different things happening also in the customer behavior. And the customer drop in the stores is about 10% uh, as an average. But the basket is, of course, increasing. So you have changed your shopping pattern. And that, of course, we need to, to uh, uh, address. So uh, digitalization with the e-commerce, but also digitalization when it comes to take out cost in supply chain, in uh, uh, all the things we are doing. We have started to introduce uh, robots. So the RR and RE is coming more important also into our industry to make sure that you can run on a low cost 
and at the same time give the customer what they're asking for when it comes to assortment, quality, service, etc. And Edgar, so this is very interesting. And you know, in light of all of that, um, how do you expect the you know will brick and mortar stores change more or less permanently in the way the shopper experience work as a result of the pandemic? Um, so, for example, I've heard on the news, I think just this morning, that um, uh, that Sainsbury's in the UK is now basically closing down all of their meat and fish counters because people move to everything being packaged. Um, you know, you mentioned that obviously, you know, people go to the stores less with bigger baskets. Um, will we see, you know, permanently altered store experiences as shoppers um, over the next 10 years? Or do you see it coming back to more or less how we saw it before? I think it will come back to more as it was before, uh, even though that e-commerce will take more part of the business. But if you take the service, the manual counters and so on, I still think that they have a, a future. Uh, but it also comes down to the cost structure, because running manual counters is quite high on the cost side. Uh, and packed is much more efficient, of course, if you can supply that. Right. And then, um, obviously, you mentioned a number of themes in terms of, you know, how your views on winning in grocery retail uh, right now and staying ahead, you know, of, of the competition in this industry that generally is still very resilient. Um, and you mentioned things like, uh, like digitalization, uh, both in e-commerce and in terms of your supply chain to keep costs under control. Um, I think we've all seen, including with your business, but also with a number of your competitors and, and other retailers in other categories, that um, things that seem to have, you know, been planned for, you know, 2022, 2023, they all happened, you know, within a matter of weeks um, and not, not, not months and months and not years. How, you know, you run a large organization, probably one of the biggest employers in this country. Um, you know, how do you um, cut through that complexity and how do you retain the agility that, that your business and many of your competitors have demonstrated in uh, you know, in this COVID crisis to make sure that you're then as agile, you're as productive, you're as quick to market with innovation and digital after the thing is gone and we're back to business as usual, quote unquote. Yeah, we are changing part in the way we are working. We are trying to uh, set up more front, uni front uh, unit teams that is having the mandate to take decision and to be more customer centric in all the aspects when we take decisions on what to do and what to change. We are also investing a lot in the, in the digitalization when it comes to resources in IT and in development and also listening more to our customer what they want us to develop. Because I think also that uh, develop for the, the sake of, of development is not a, a good thing. You need to develop and listen to the customers. What do they really want when you are uh, investing in that area? And then um, uh, sort of as I guess we get into more of this discussion on uh, of digital that will carry on. Um, what is your view on, again, as a sort of as a strategy professor, I can't not ask that question on, you know, what do you do yourself versus where do you partner with others? So, for example, you have built your e-commerce proposition yourself, uh, but then for some of the express deliveries, you partner with the likes of Walt or Bold Food that deliver, uh, deliver uh, restaurant meals <coughs> and now groceries. So what is your thinking about, you know, can you, you know, should you be partnering more with others to make it quicker? Or do you feel like having more control over your digitalization is so important that you'd rather, you'd rather stick, stick with it yourself? When it comes to the development of the IT tools and, and uh, different things, uh, we are partnering up with others. But when it comes to the interface with the customer, the one that sees the customer, we want it to be trained and, and uh, a reamy person that is meeting the customers in the future. So that's why we are investing a lot in the training uh, for the, the drivers and the delivery, really to make sure that they give cu good customer service in our uh, way of doing our home deliveries. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think that, that that's more or less explains that. So you would basically, you would say uh, it's still so important for you that you would try to keep as much of it in-house and you'd only look at partnerships with others um, as, as a way, like a temporary measure to accelerate something. 
we do partnerships when it comes to the development in the back office, but when it comes to the interface of the customer, it will be the Remy brand that the customers are facing with our people. No, that makes sense. And then I think a similar question to, to the question that we've asked uh, uh, Martin Gauss before, um, sort of as you, I guess you reflect on an industry that you know, has done well and demonstrated strong resilience through, through this uh, COVID crisis, uh, but also experienced a lot of transformation. Um, as you reflect on it for you know, the benefit of business leaders and other industries, you know, what kind of lessons can you offer them? You know, what do you think, uh, which bits of your experience are generalizable, maybe a little bit more universal uh, than just your industry? Yes, it's a very good question, but I would say very, very hard question to answer because all the, these uh, industries are so different and the customer or the, or the behaviors of people are so different in each industry. But I would say that continue to develop and satisfy your customers with more detail, digitalization and cost efficiency. That is what you need to, to uh, continue to develop. Right, so I guess, I guess the themes that we're so far picking up from you and that we've picked up from, from Martin Gauss were around, I guess both, both, both of you talk about cost control, which is quite interesting, even though you do come from very different places, obviously. Uh, Martin, an industry with very high fixed cost and a massive damage to volume. You coming from an industry with very high variable cost um, and you know volume, uh, volumes that are essentially acyclical. Uh, yet both of you talk about cost control, which is something I find uh, quite interesting. And then obviously, you know, Martin talking about sustainability, you talking about digitalization. Um, I think both of these are interesting lessons that, again, we'll get back to our discussion uh, in our discussion later on. Uh, but Edgar, this was uh, really useful. Thank you. I now want to turn to, uh, to Manauser, who, uh, you know, you look at it from a different angle. You know, you obviously, whereas Martin and, um, and Edgar look at it from uh, their, their organizations and their industries' perspectives. As a private equity investor, your perspective is obviously considerably wider. You know, um, Edgar cannot decide that I'm not going to do retail anymore. I'm now going to go into something else, uh, right? Whereas, whereas you have, so, so he's sort of stuck with it and he has to, you know, and Martin is stuck with it. They have to find their way to navigate and win in there. You, on the other hand, have this, you know, relative, uh, relative luxury of, uh, sort of picking industries that are um, great for value creation for uh, for your firm and for your uh, limited partners. So, in over the past few months, sort of for you as a as a GP, um, you know, how has your thinking on on industry trajectories evolved? Because again. Um, when I talk to um, all of my uh, friends and colleagues in private equity, for example, everyone tells me in, you know, before the pandemic, uh, anything related to travel was seen as a great investment thesis. Passenger numbers are going up, you know, anything, uh, any of that infrastructure would have been seen as attractive. All of the infrastructure around um, convenience for people in offices, you know, Edgar is opening his Rumi Express stores to serve people in offices, um, as are, you know, many, you know, sandwich shops, um, uh, barbers, etc. Now all of that suddenly disappears overnight. So how has your thinking as an investor about industries has changed? Thanks, Yuri. Uh, well, hello uh, to, to everyone, uh, first of all. And um, thank you, Yuri, for, for having me as, as part of this, this distinguished panel. Um, really, really appreciate the invite. Um, perhaps to contextualize, um, my comments let me start with a very brief introduction on well on myself i'm probably the, the least well-known person on, on the panel and 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 then the firm um and then i'll move on to, to to answer your your question um so i'm a graduate of the school uh it it, it feels like a long time ago um now though um and it's a big week it's uh, it's a big week for us here in uh, in the uk with the start of the second uh, lockdown it's it's a big week in in the us obviously um and it's a big week for for me because i um i got my uh plastic watch um earlier um uh, in in the week um on the account of a 10-year anniversary with a with a firm um so it's been a while um thank you and um, color as a setup is, is a quite a traditional private equity um, shop um, within the universe of private equity. We're quite specialized and, and focused though, on uh, what's called the secondaries. 
Um, so essentially, we provide liquidity on existing illiquid um, assets. Um, unfortunately, we haven't done much in the Baltics. Our, our focus is mostly on Western Europe and, and the US. Um, the vast majority of what we invest in is, is equity, um, a little bit of credit. We don't do anything really in, in the currencies or, or the rates, uh, except for bona fide hedging. Um, and our strategy, in essence, is investing in large diversified pools of illiquid um, assets. Um, so literally every fund ends up with two to 3,000 underlying companies. So think of it as a, as a private index. Um, we tend to buy mature assets. So the cash velocity is, is higher. Um, and we still manage to uh, invest at a, at a discount. So there is a margin of safety relative to the, to the fair uh, market values. So that's uh, color capital in a nutshell. Um, in, in, in terms of the, the, the industry uh, attractiveness, um, going back to the beginning of the year, first to say uh, no one who's frank about the assessment uh, did see the COVID coming. We, 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 have, we, we had no idea. Um, having said that, there, there was a general sense of unease for quite a period of time already vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the devaluation excesses in the public markets, vis-a-vis -vis the, the free-flowing free uh, credit. Um, and so we, have, we had pivoted our, our strategy to, to, to adapt uh, to, to those circumstances. And so when we look at what we currently have in our new fund, um, about 70% is in three sectors, which is healthcare, uh, software uh, and consumer staples. Um, and then on the other hand, we have less than 5% in what would be uh, energy, travel and leisure. Um, and so far, we're reasonably pleased with, uh, with the performance of, of, of those assets. In terms of the, the, the COVID itself, it, 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 it was obviously relatively short lived in, in the financial markets. Um, and so we did deploy capital, but, but in hindsight, not, uh, not enough that the, the, the policy response was um, unprecedented. Um, and, um, and, and we're still frankly scratching our heads as to, as, as to what's gonna happen uh, next. Um, but if there is one overarching theme uh, in terms of how we approach the world is, is, is that recognition of a bifurcation amongst industries, within industries. Um, um, to pick on an example of entertainment, let's say, in March, the live entertainment was down 80% to 100%. On the other hand, um, the Apple screen time was up 40%. Netflix was up 40%. 5%, I believe. Um, so very tough times for live entertainment. Um, amazing uh, new trajectory and pace um, for, for, for digital uh, entertainment. Um, so it is, it, is, it is increasingly becoming more difficult to simplify life. It, we we, we, we got to stick with the micro bottoms up approach in terms of how we assess opportunities. Um, but having said that, th there are clearly sectors which are which are being uh, tested and challenged at the moment. And as far as as bids go, um, it's it's very difficult to find a compelling bid um, today in in oil and gas, in 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 brick and mortar finance, in in retail, which is which is not staples. Um, travel, hospitality, um, those, are, those are very difficult sectors to price at the moment. And, and would you say, so this is, this is very interesting, obviously, you know, you're, um, you've got your own portfolio that you mentioned, you know, is, is very heavy on, on things like healthcare software um, and consumer staples, um, and then very light on most of the other industries. And then obviously the, the funds that you provide liquidity to, I guess you're sort of... Um, uh, Put, put yourself in their shoes and sort of which industries they're looking at. Would you say there were very significant um, changes in valuation multiples in private equity deals in many of those industries? Or would you say that there was, you know, people were just less prepared to do deals 
and and um, you know some of these transactions have sort of cut back a little bit, but still happening at about the same multiples that you would see pre pre COVID. What was the reaction um, on that front? Um, well, the initial reaction was 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 just a general confusion. Obviously, um, um, it, it it feels that the, the 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 consensus view in in March April was that there's not going to be a quick rebound. Again, partially because no one expected the policy response that, that we've seen um, to, to, to the crisis. And so for, for many investors, the market that just traded away um, too quickly. Um, in terms of the valuations, um, again, there's so much bifurcation. You look at NASDAQ uh, composite, which is significantly up, and you look at FTSE 100, which is significantly down relative to, um, to, to, to the beginning of the year. And, and I guess in, in this particular example, the, 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 the most obvious explanation is the, is, the, is the composition where one is very heavy on tech and the other one is very light um, on tech. And, and, and so definitely there, there's been a further re-rating, uh, again, when it comes to software, uh, for, for, for example. Um, but otherwise, um, we, we certainly continue to, to, to find it challenging to, to come up with a fundamental underwrite and a conviction behind that underwrite when it comes to, 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 to so many sectors. And, and so um, the pricing uh, from our perspective has widened very meaningfully. Um, so on the secondary basis, we're, we're again looking to transact at, at discount levels. Um, and by discount, I mean relative to the reported fair, fair market values. Um, discount levels we have not seen uh, since the GFC. Um, so you're talking, right. you know, 20, 30 percent time discount ranges on otherwise perfectly good assets. Right. And then, Martish, another point I want to unpack a little bit that you uh, uh, you touched on, um, which is uh, you said there's a bifurcation between industries, which I think is fairly clear to most of us. You know, and you've given examples. You also talked about bi bifurcation within industries. So something uh, that we talked about in the beginning that, you know, crisis create winners and losers within the same industry. Um, how, you know, from an investor perspective, you know, do you think about, you know, telling a potential winner from a potential loser? So do you, um, you or, you know, or other GPs, um, uh, you know, private equity funds, what kind of red flags are maybe new red flags that, that you're now on the lookout for when you look at an opportunity uh, to tell, you know, is this company positioned to win in the industry or not? Sure. Um, two two parts to the answer, I suppose. One is um, one is around the private equity industry, the model it, it, itself, which which is quite resilient. Um, as, as as you probably know, uh, most private equity funds are ten year structures, low end funds, where investors commit for the entirety of that period, including paying the fees. Um, and so, rain or shine. Uh, but there is a, a high degree of visibility in terms of the, the, the revenue uh, for, for a private equity manager as, as an operating um, uh, business. Um, the short-term winners in, in, in our um, world were, were some of the distressed managers who were very quick react to the expectation of, 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 of the crisis uh, and, and either um, raised capital on, on the back of that or, or activated uh, vehicles that had, had been set up um, uh, in the past, um, which were so, the so-called crisis vehicles. Um, the other winners, and, and, and this is to, to, to Mr. Gauss's earlier uh, point about uh, uh, difficulty of uh, of concluding billion deals over or zoom or, or who knows maybe it's just a matter of time and, and, and we'll come on to it but but but, but the same um, challenge is playing out in terms of the fundraising um in the private equity world where the institutional investors the pension funds etc um just find it so much more straightforward to re-up with existing relationships as opposed to uh, being able to do diligence and and commit hundred or five hundred or whatever the amount is million to to a new relationship they they've never had before. So that's the private equity world. But but it, as we're looking out in terms of the the, the investment uh, exactly. process for us, yeah, that's exactly. I think that was almost more of the question is you know 
when you look at, let's say, a consumer staples company or you look at a software company uh, as, a, as an investor, as a GP, so yeah. what, does it, what does it, you know, what do you, how do you tell a winner from a loser? Or a potential yeah. winner, rather, from a potential loser? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if um, I have a great answer to it because our, our mindset is, is fundamentally different um, and, and it's come through a lot of lessons learned and they've been very reluctant to accept it. But, but the basic notion being is that we, we cannot pick winners. We, we, we cannot beat the market consistently over a long period of time deploying capital at scale. So that's not the, object, the daily objective for us to, to pick the next uh, uh, winner. Um, for us, the objective, in a way, is, is to be boring, uh, proudly boring, and, and, and do the same thing we did yesterday, but just slightly better, perhaps, to, to today. So we're investing at pace in, in the down market, in an up market. We obviously adjust and pivot the strategy. Uh, a little bit, seeking the best relative value and 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 keeping an emphasis on de-risking the the, the, the investments. Um, looking back at how industries and companies performed during the the, the GFC, um, continuing to apply conservative underwriting assumptions in terms of multiple contractions, uh, in terms of slower growth rates, etc. But 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 our mindset certainly is 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 not is not about picking winners. Right. Okay, look, maybe then, then uh, again, taking a step back and concluding with uh, sort of the same question people picked up that I, I ask everyone is sort of, um, I mean, you're a principal investor. So uh, sort of what is your message to uh, management teams and chief executives uh, in terms of, you know, looking from that investor perspective in the situation that, the, that generally business is now in almost as a, as a macro phenomenon, you know, what should they be on the lookout for? You know, what are the, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah. What, what, should, what, what should they keep at the back of their head at all times? We're, we're very careful not to tell CEOs how to fly planes or, or how to organize grocery logistics. Um, again, it's just that realization that, that we, we don't know. Um, but uh, but it, it, it's clear that it's going to be exciting times ahead of us. Uh, it should be a, a lot of fun over the next 12 months if, 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 if you want to uh, see the silver lining uh, in it. Uh, uh, th th there should be an opportunity um, uh, for, for all of the, us there. But, uh, but, uh, but again, I would agree with the, with the points that were raised earlier um, by Mr. Gauss is that the, the, the first and foremost is, is, is just to monitor the liquidity position to make sure that, that you keep the foundation to capture whatever that opportunity is and, and, and do it from a, uh, from, a, from a kind of offensive um, strong position. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's really that. Right. Well, look, I appreciate this. I think it's a very um, candid way of looking at it, um, reading, uh, reading, um, about the industry, you know, following the likes of the Financial Times, if you don't keep your liquidity at sufficient levels, you end up in fairly ugly situations that, you know, historically private equity firms knew how to navigate really well. Um, now, I guess they, uh, some of them end up in these kinds of, uh, you know, very unattractive uh, positions as well. So I can, I can definitely distill a theme from, you know, all of the speakers here around sort of liquidity and survival uh, being being sort of uh, front and center of all of this. And I can see why maybe Edgar is not bringing this up as much because I guess that was never as much for risk. Uh, end up in these kinds of, uh, you know, very unattractive uh, positions as well. So I can... I can uh, there was a number of speakers talked about digital you know edgar talked a lot about digitalization retail uh you know uh martin's talked about investing um in in software businesses that ultimately digitize other businesses um so this whole concept of digital transformation is this um sort of mantra that just about everyone you talk to um is gonna tell you that this is my priority number one um in a number of ways so um, but, um, you know, what does that actually mean? You know, what is digital transformation and, and how, you know, how do businesses um, think of it as a, as a lever to win against competition? 
Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, the opportunity to be here. Happy to see uh, course mates uh, Martins and Andres here, uh, all represented, uh, class 20, uh, 2002. Um, uh, I think digitalization uh, as a way to win is, uh, is the way that the winners think. Uh, what we see a lot in the industry is, um, I think there's a huge chunk of, uh, of industry and also public administration, which is looking at digitalization as a, as a catching up exercise, uh, as something where they, it's something they have to do uh, and they're probably late. Um, I, I think uh, looking at uh, the markets in general, uh, my assessment would be that uh, at least in Europe and, and I think probably globally, there's a structural deficit of uh, the capacity to digitally transform. And, and I think uh, a vast majority of organizations are, are behind the curve. So, so I think that for, for many, it's actually a, a play of catch up. Right. And which industries do you think are particularly sensitive to you know whether they transform substantially enough and quickly enough? So, you know, where, where do you say, you know, which, which industry do you think is, is the most ahead of the curve and the most behind the curve? If you took that kind of macro look almost. Sure. Uh, and, and uh, you know, in this assessment, I would include, uh, you know, the public sector and healthcare as well, because, you know, the, being um, major parts of our society and, and while, uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps the you know, competition between countries is not uh, perfect, you know, we, we, we see it in Europe, at least, uh, you know, people move, uh, voting with their feet as well. So, so uh, I think generally speaking, uh, you know, we in the Baltics are, uh, you know, doing really well and, and you know, being proud coming from Tallinn, I think Estonia is doing really well. Uh, and, but I think that the vast majority of pu public administrations is really behind. And, and I think this is also what we've witnessed across Europe and, and the world. Um, uh, you know, my main, uh, my, my own main business for the last few years has been Germany. And, and uh, if we take Germany, for example, you know, the conventional uh, approach to digitalization has been that uh, it's, it's seen as a risk uh, because of data privacy concerns. And I think uh, the society at large and decision makers have now realized that, you know, not being digital is actually a bigger risk. Uh, I, I think healthcare as well is, is behind the curve. Um, uh, I think that uh, there are huge uh, deficiencies uh, in industries, you know, such as uh, uh, automotive. Uh, where you have, you know, clear digital winners and then you have uh, companies that are really behind. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of, um, you know, transformation successfully uh, in, uh, in a lot of uh, industries, let's say, for example, travel or, or media. And, uh, you know, as, as Martin also outlined earlier, but I think it has been really evenly uh, distributed. And, and here we come to this uh, concept of, you know, global platforms. So if we look at the travel, if we look at entertainment, uh, uh, you know, potentially healthcare in the future, we see uh, that digitalization has also, and retail, of course, uh, obviously, uh, we, we see this huge wave of, uh, you know, global platforms consolidating uh, huge chunks of the market. So it's, it's really distributed unevenly. So do you then think that, um, you know, when we talk about global platforms, um, then which industries may be um, at risk of these global platforms taking a disproportionate share of value because they're so much more digitally sophisticated. So for example, you know, should, um, should Edgar be worried um, about, about the Rimi Baltic business um, or, or, you know, shouldn't he, is it so, so local? So who, sh who should be worried um, about global platforms from a competitive perspective? Sure. Well, I think, you know, what we've seen, uh, and I think this is uh, already also discussed uh, at least here in the Baltics uh, quite openly, uh, you know, media, uh, content. Uh, I mean, the advertising uh, funds are, uh, you know, this is a global, global competition in a, in a way now. So our, our own newspapers and, and local portals, they are actively competing with, with platforms. Uh, that's, that's pretty obvious. Uh, you know, media distribution, you know, Spotify, Apple TV, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think that uh, that's following suit. Um, I, I'm not qualified to have an opinion, I think, on retail. I think Edgar uh, you know, knows much better. Uh, I, I, my own feeling, personal feeling, is that you know, at least for some time, we might be sheltered by the uh, 
relatively small size of our market. So, you know, it's, it's maybe not interesting enough for the global players to make a serious play. Um, but uh, it's not really my uh, area of expertise here. Actually, um, if, if you don't mind, if I can open this a little bit um, uh, to, to a broader debate, and, um, and maybe Edgar, if we could come back to you and talk about digitalization retail. Um, you know, you obviously know a lot about Sweden. Um, you know, Sweden uh, just had um, Amazon uh, launch there. Uh, you know, obviously uh, an incredibly digitally sophisticated business. Is it really bad news for, um, you know, specialist retailers in Sweden or for, for, for instance, you know, even for your, uh, your parent, Ica, should Amazon go into grocery? So is that, is that thing that Tavi talks about, you know, the global platform, is that a problem? Or do you think that, that businesses are still relatively insulated from that? No, I think that, uh, I mean, we are primarily a food retailer. So if I were in the, in the non-food side of retail, then I would be more worried that the huge part of the, of the market can be moved to this uh, bigger platform. But for, for retail and food retail, local is still very important to have your local products and, and your local assortment. And, and uh, before we see Amazon, I think, moving into the Baltic countries in food, that will take a long, uh, a long time. But maybe they already, I mean, even I buy from Amazon in Germany some of the products that I can't find, and it's quite easy shopping. But on the food side, I think we, we, it will take a long time before we see those platforms. But the technique that they are using and the artificial intelligence in the, and the, in the customer knowledge that they are crea- building, that is the same thing that we are building up internally also for our customers today. Right. And if, you, if, if we, I mean, Baltics, I guess I buy the argument that perhaps you know, here you're relatively insulated because the, the markets are relatively small. Uh, but if you look at Sweden, for example, where they just launched, um, and they obviously um, include, amongst other things, uh, you know, they have Amazon Fresh, they acquired Whole Foods and, uh, you know, around um, in the United States and around the world. Um, do you think that this is, you know, if not in the next five years, next 15 years is going to become more of a, you know, a global play? Or or you think, again, that, that for Ica, for example, or for Co-op or Willys or the other Swedish grocery retailers, they're not really under that much threat long term? Long term, maybe, but then we are talking really, really long term. I think that Amazon also need to get their food operation in better shape before they start moving into new markets. So I will definitely be not a part of the of that business at, at that moment in time. Right, right. And then, and then maybe, uh, maybe, uh, Tavi, back to you. Uh, you know, um, Edgar is saying what's, what's quite interesting to me is that um, obviously there are a lot of um, operational things but that some of the underlying technology is sort of the same at Amazon and at Remy. You know, would you, would you agree with that? Do you think that you, know, you, you can take a lot of these technological solutions and sort of roll them out um, uh, businesses that are obviously a lot smaller than Amazon um, and can be digitally transformed to the extent that they would be using a lot of that technology uh, to increase their productivity quite a lot? Um, I, I do think that's true. Uh, I, I think that uh, the speed at which uh, you know novel technology technological solutions become, let's say, relatively commodities and are uh, available, uh, you know, for uh, you know maybe companies with smaller balance sheets uh, or investment capabilities. I think that's definitely true, and and I think we've seen a lot of those uh, uh, you know tools or mechanisms uh, you know become available. So I, I think this is definitely uh, happening. Um, and and um, uh, I, I think that again, probably out of my competence zone here, but uh, uh, it, it probably comes down more to you know where do you really have this kind of massive economies of scale effect, or where you don't. Uh, and then the emotional side, as Edgar was saying, you know you want your you know local local stuff, even if it's uh, even if it's online. Right, and then maybe I want to come back to uh, to Martin Gauss thinking about the digital perspective. Um, uh, are you satisfied with how digital the business that you lead is? You know, we obviously talked about it with Edgar a lot, we talked about it with others. Uh, you know, airlines are still fundamentally a very offline business, right? You put people on planes and fly them, but of course there's a lot of it um, uh, going on um, behind the scenes and there are a lot of consumer front ends with you know, people, people booking tickets and using digital ecosystems with you know, price comparison websites, et cetera. Where do you see your digital trajectory in an industry that's probably seen as relatively offline otherwise? So as, as you said, in the airline industry, uh, in our lifetime, we will not see our core function of taking a human from A to B 
uh, that being done digital. So our, our key function to transport a person from A to B will not be digital. Around us, um, everything will be digital and of course not fast enough for me because um, there's a lot of things which could be done better already today and every traveler knows that. Why can you not with one click like in Amazon buy your ticket? Yeah. Um, it's, there's a lot of players involved why you cannot do it and all the bottlenecks you have uh, where you could with digitalization do it so much easier and we have the next thing coming now because we had September 11 where you suddenly had to empty all your bags and it never stopped uh, even with the most modern machine you are held up to go to an aircraft and now we will have after COVID probably something similar coming with tests before. I just hope that the digitalization if we look at the uh, at the apps, the COVID apps, something very good. But of course, there you could incorporate then in the future a, a lot of tools. You could say when you come to a border control that this is the same app, you could inc incorporate your electronic ID. So for airlines, digitalization is a very big item. And we, of course, do everything we can. Unfortunately, there's so many touch points where we are not the ones who take the decision. If it's about us, we, we try to provide the maximum uh, as airlines in, in form of digitalization to our customers. Right. And um, I'm going to actually um, maybe abuse my position for my own personal curiosity as someone who used to be a relatively frequent traveler um, and digitalization airlines. So, Martin, are you ever going to eliminate uh, check-in and make it fully digital where I would just receive my boarding pass uh, automatically without having to do anything manually? It's what one question I just had personally was, why does check-in still exist um, as a process where it's something that should be a lot more digitally seamless than perhaps uh, before? The, the, because you, ha you have to confirm to the airline that you want to do it, but there are already airlines which say, if you give us the freedom, we send you the boarding pass automatically. And actually we have a one-click check-in already. But yes, I, I agree with you. Um, a lot of things, if you and me have to do it, and there would be no nobody else, I think we would, within a day, find the ideal solution how to make that easier. It is something we are doing. We always go for innovation. But there is a lot of players, a lot of regulations in our industry, which makes it so difficult. Once you are on board, people are not having any issue because then they do what they wanted to do. They go from A to B. The problem is today to get on board of an airplane is so complicated due to the bottleneck of the airports where a lot of restrictions are there or the border controls, but the flying itself, you can fly across the whole globe and there's no pause and no break and no disturbance of that. So that is working. What is not yet working the way it could, a, a one click buy of a ticket like an Amazon, mm -hmm. or then uh, with that one click, you already checked in and you just go. But I think that is coming in our industry because it's just a matter of time. The, the, the willingness is there from the airlines because we would benefit from it. Customers would benefit. The bottleneck airport, maybe now with uh, after the pandemic and the need maybe for testing, which would actually relight our industry, um, might bring us um, some advantages on that because you need to somehow incorporate it in that process and still keep it fast. The first trials are there. Um, that uh, the first flights are going 100% uh, uh, COVID-free because you do fast tests. So I think we will see a lot of this in the next months. And then uh, with that, of course, you will have incorporated in your boarding pass. And But again, uh, digitalization for us is a big item. We try to do our utmost, but once uh, we come to our limits, then of course we cannot, uh, cannot go further. And, and do you think that, um, again, in the next, let's say, 10 years, in your industry it's going to become an increasingly important lever to win that um, that for example all of these experiences around getting on board an aircraft or, or about buying your ticket um, are they going to be important competitive differentiators um, or is it just more of a nice to have a little convenience for a relatively small segment of of perhaps more frequently traveling customers how much of a role in your strategy will these you know digital experiences play um, going forward a, a key role. So uh, social media, of course, is a key. sustainability as the number one social media and then everything around digitalization. If we look at the increase in mobile bookings coming from mobile devices each year, it's more than doubling from the year before. So we are coming to a point where everything is just going to be done mobile. And then, of course, the same with all the whatever you receive from the airline to to conduct your flight needs to be fully digital. 
the airport experience the same way? Why, why do you have to go somewhere? And, and there are airports and there are lots of trials already happening where this digitalization is a lot further than, than we see it here. So it is coming the next 10 years will be bringing a lot of news uh, on that front because it's there, the technology is there. It's just airlines uh, are coordinating it with airports and countries and that makes it a bit difficult. Right, right, I can imagine. Um, so uh, thank you, Martin. I want to get back to, to Martin Spanhauser on that same whole digitalization question. So um, I guess when you think about um, opportunities and you obviously, you mentioned you invest a lot in software, right? But, but also, you know, for some of the other businesses, do you have a, you know, a somewhat systematic way of thinking about, you know, backing businesses that win because they're more digital? Or does this come as maybe more of a, a side question when you look at an opportunity? So how central is it to, to your approach to really understanding industry attractiveness, understanding opportunity of individual businesses? No, it's absolutely a, a very relevant, a very topical considerations. Um, if, if not for all, then for, 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 for most businesses. And, and there are areas that, that, that have been obviously completely overhyped as well. So the, the, the SaaS is, 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 the, is, is, is the main one in a way, right? Where, um, where, where the valuation multiples change very dramatically depending on whether you bought the business sort of pre-SaaS and then it successfully transitions into SaaS and, 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 and how the valuation gets uh, re-rated uh, at that point. Um, so it's definitely uh, relevant, but, uh, but I guess generically, um, like with many of these types of kind of overhyped um, uh, tendencies, then it's, um, it's, it's also important just to make sure that there is a real substance uh, behind it and, 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 and relevance. Um, in our own business, when it comes to digitalization, there are probably two main aspects to it. One is, is, is how the transactions are executed. Um, and, 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 and there's been a push over time to essentially introduce more transparency, more technology in terms of how the private transactions are, are executed. Um, and so far with, with moderate success. Um, not, not least, again, because fundamentally in our line of business, efficiency and transparency is often the enemy of our charge. So we, we like illiquid nature, we like opaque, uh, we, we like limited information because that all results um, ultimately in, in potentially a bigger uh, spread. Um, and then internally, um, I guess the one interesting realization we've, we've had, we have a small uh, AI team um, now um, that's been developing uh, algorithms for us in terms of to, to enhance our ability to, to forecast performance um, with certain types of, of investor uh, investments. And an interesting realization there has been that um, that um, that the algorithm is important. Um, but what introduces a, a, a much more statistically significant um, um, swing for the outcome is, is, is access to data. Uh, so I'm gonna be a, 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 on purpose a bit controversial in saying that, that, that the bright minds and, and, and the brain power is, is becoming more of a commodity, I would argue. Um, and, and, and what remains much more challenging is the ability to secure the input, um, especially in, in private markets. Right, uh, which in a way I think um, is music to our ears as a business school, because of course, uh, you know, I think we're, we're also very much seeing this movement um, to an age where, you know, things like access to information and transparency and processing power, analytical processing power, all become commodities. So a lot of the things that um, at SSC Riga you know, in all of our programs from, you know, undergrads who are 18 year old to, uh, to executive MBAs who are very experienced to all our education, um, executive education participants, where we think of, you know, how do we 
uh, build on that? And how do we um, build things like uh, facts and science mindedness, empathy, reflection, all of these things that are much more difficult to, uh, to commoditize, I think, along the ways of um, you've been talking about, Pastor. So I think we're, that makes us confident, I guess, that we're also moving in the right direction. And on that same front, um, uh, you know, Martin uh, Gauss mentioned another thing uh, as his top priority, you know, which is uh, sustainability, which I guess is not a surprise. But again, uh, how do you think about, you know, as, an inve as a principal investor, um, obviously there's um, this whole concept of ESG, environmental, social and governance, that's now, you know, um, one of the central points of, of all of the asset management industry. But, but as you look at opportunities, you know, what again, um, how important of a role does that play and what maybe specific things are you on the lookout for to really figure out that, that sustainability um, element if it's important? Sure. Um, ESG is um, is very important um, for, for our firm, for, for our investment processes. It's, it's a very integral part of, um, of, of our uh, investment underwriting uh, process. Um, and, it, and it plays out in, 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 in very uh, practical ways. We, um, we either find the ability to, to influence and, 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 and make that impact in terms of the uh, improvement um, when it comes to a specific uh, company, for example, to, to increase their, uh, their ESG uh, standards, or, or often the alternative is where we just don't, don't transact at all or in situations where we cannot, um, by design, um, uh, change the business. Um, let's say um, uh, an entertainment park that involves dolphins, for example. Okay. I can think of a transaction where we walked away from that asset because, well, it, it just is what it is. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good business, but, um, but just on animal, animal welfare uh, grounds, we were, were not uh, we're not willing um, uh, to, to pursue. Um, we're also, also perhaps somewhat strangely, I'm going to say, um, uh, proud that we are um, uh, an, an envir environmentally neutral company ourselves. Uh, flying, in our case, was, was the main, uh, the main offset that, uh, that we needed to, to, to incorporate. The reason I'm saying str strategy played, strangely proud is, is, is because I would like us to be positive uh, on balance rather than just, just neutral. Um, but I think that's, that's, that's the first step. And on that note, by the way, I'm, I'm really interested to get your views on. Um, so do you see uh, you yourself as a principal investor in your farm more as a sort of a, a mechanism for picking um, great, you know, ESG, so sustainable businesses and backing them? Um, or do you see yourself as a force for transforming businesses from, you know, maybe being less sustainable to being more sustainable? I guess you probably, like you mentioned, you do both, but, but what's the relative sort of significance of those two um, approaches, if you will? Honestly, I, I don't know exactly how to quantify it, but, but, but I agree with you that both are, are important. Um, so again, there, there are situations where, where, we, um, where we just don't bid, uh, and, and, and that's a way to express um, a view on, on the situation. Um, or we have an internal ESG team that, that works quite closely with, uh, with, with other managers we invest in or, or companies uh, directly. Um, in, in, in terms of um, enhancing the understanding uh, uh, around the ESG uh, considerations and, and proposing specific um, uh, changes to, to, to the strategy and, and, and so on. Right. Uh, so it's both. And I now want to turn to, to Tavi with that actually. So Tavi, if we now try to synthesize these two themes, the, the digitalization, which you know, you're uh, um, obviously a, a big champion of, and then, and then sustainability. How do you use digital to help uh, companies become more sustainable and sort of embed purpose a bit more? Sort of, um, are these two things, you know, how complementary are they? Are they in a sense of pursuing those objectives from your point of view? Sure. So I think that, uh, let's say, generally speaking, uh, obviously there's a you know, clear connection between efficiency and, and sustainability. And, uh, you know, what we see in performing uh, digital transformations you know, across industries 
is that there are typically uh, huge efficiency uh, savings that can be achieved, um, uh, which come from a variety of sources, including travel, logistics, energy use, uh, you know, paper use. Uh, but I think most importantly, when we talk about digital transformation, you know, digital, digital is only part of the transformation. So the successful cases are in fact, you know, they change the structure of the uh, operation or, or perhaps the industry. Um, of course, you also have the downside. So I think, you know, uh, it's still uh, a debate, you know, whether getting uh, lunch from world food or world food is sustainable or not. Um, so, so I think that it's, uh, it's a little bit case by case, but fundamentally, there, there are huge efficiency uh, uh, savings to be, to be had. I maybe want to um, explore that. Um, so I, th I think this all makes sense. I want to explore that even a bit further. And now I think, especially with the pandemic, you know, we're having this sure. uh, conversation um, online, which in a way is great because uh, Tavi, you're sat in, in Tallinn, right? Yes. Um, if I'm not mistaken. And Martin just sat um, uh, in London. Um, and Edgar and Martin, I guess you're both um, in Riga, Latvia, um, uh, as am I. You know, so it's a delight that you know we can all connect. Um, you know, virtually with our audience, who's probably all over um, Europe, if not the world, because our alumni are, you know, live in many places. So, so this is the beauty of digital. You know, if we ran it all uh, offline, you know, we would not be able to perhaps do it in the same way. At the same time, um, I have to confess, that, you know, I would have been so delighted to to meet you in person and you know and shake your hand and really see your facial expressions beyond just what I see on the screen. Um, and I do miss that that human connection. So uh, do you, if, if I sort of extrapolate that into a sort of much more elevated level, Tavi, do you not have a, a bit of a concern that digitalization taken, you know, when we say we need to be even more digital, and even more digital. I used to talk to my doctor in his office. Now I talk to my doctor on video to use your healthcare examples. Is that not going to take us to a place where it's actually less sustainable from a mental health perspective, from an empathy perspective, from a human connection perspective? Are we not going into some sort of a black mirror dystopia with all of your digital initiatives? Well, the short answer is that yes, we are. Um, uh, but I think, uh, uh, I think it all depends on the uh, time frame we're looking at. I mean, you know, to be honest, I'm, I'm personally, if we take a very long perspective, uh, I'm quite concerned about uh, you know where this uh, AI will take us in a sense that uh, uh, you know when I think that in, in many situations we are already uh, um, at the point where uh, the AI has not yet reached uh, you know the human uh, smartness level but it has definitely already or human strength level but it has surpassed the human weakness level uh, you know and recently seen the Netflix movie I think uh, many have and uh, and in a situation where you know AI uh, you know, might already be better at selecting your your wife or you know future partner. I think that's a, a philosophically a very dark, dark place to be. And and uh, you know my, my personal view is that uh, in the in the generations to come, I think people will have you know many few, fewer children than you know we are having perhaps because of this. Now scaling this back uh, to something a little bit uh, uh, closer to us. Uh, I think that uh, in the short term, uh, there are like huge benefits to be had. And assuming that, uh, you know, we are able to travel, I think many people, you know, me including, uh, would feel like you. Um, uh, and, and we would choose to travel, uh, you know, more often than we are doing right now, but perhaps, you know, less than uh, a year ago, which I think is really great. Uh, and, and, and I think, as, as Martin said also, it, it filtrates out the unnecessary travel. Um, uh, but I think it, it all will take time, and, and uh, I would like to uh, kind of agree with Martins. Martins was saying that you know the, the talent will become a commodity. I agree with this, but I think it will take time. In, in a similar way, like Edgar was saying that you know Amazon taking over the food retail business that will also take time, uh, because what we are seeing is that uh, you know if, if you take the digital transformation industry, you know professional services industry. We are always operating on, on two markets. So we are, of course, you know, fighting for our customers, working with our customers. But because of the labor market, we are also fighting for talent. And, and you know, one of the uh, ways I think how uh, this crisis will again separate you know, winners from losers is your, your approach to talent. And, and what we saw in, in, uh, in March, April, you know, 
you know, companies took different routes and, and probably depending on so, you know, whether they had capital available, whether they you know, had secured funding. But we had uh, both professional services companies and startups, which is a you know, huge competitor here in the Baltics for talent. Uh, you know, some went and aggressively, you know, quick reaction, cut you know, 10%, 20% of the workforce and the others remain stable. And, and now that we've seen the bounce back, I think you know, this will be one of the key um, indicators of the winners and losers in, in this specific industry, you know, fighting for talent. Right. And on, on a related note um, to that, Dantavi, when you talk to your clients about you know, digitalization, digital transformation, um, how do you help them understand some of these darker sides of it? Uh, sort of, is, is that something that a lot of your, your clients or business you support think about already? Or is it just more of a, you know, we are fantasizing a little bit. It's all a bit of a funny dystopia, something that you see in the movies. Um, but um, uh, is, 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 so I'm trying to understand, you know, the whole sustainability dimension from these, you know, very nuanced, you know, you know mental health, human well-being perspective. How do businesses, do they actively think about reconciling that dimension of sustainability with digitalization? Or is that not a very sort of mature uh, theme yet uh, for, for most of them? I, I think that's something uh, which is you know, being discovered more and more. Uh, and I think also it's, it's not the one way street. Uh, you know, let's say if we take the same uh, you know, mental health as, as a discussion point, uh, we're obviously seeing a lot of people, or let's say at least a significant number of people who are you know, not happy working from home, not, not happy uh, not being able to connect to their relatives, friends, etc. Uh, but I also see, uh, at least in our own business, you know, we, of course, or not of course, but we were lucky enough that we were able to uh, reconfigure how we work in a, in a matter of a few days. You know, move to home offices, everybody's fine. We're an international company. We're anyway used to Zoom and, and everything else. So, you know, it was easy for us. What we see is that some of our colleagues obviously not doing very well. Uh, we're trying to help them, provide counseling, uh, help. Uh, you know, gaming, uh, all kinds of things to, to make them feel better. But we are also seeing uh, not a small number of colleagues who are thriving. So there's a huge number, again, not a huge number, but a significant number of people we see doing really well in this environment. So I think uh, as in many industries or, or many markets, the true answer is uh, personalization. So, so what we see is that there are a lot of people who would like to be in the office, but you know, to be honest, me personally, extremely happy, uh, you know, I have a white shirt on, but I have, uh, you know, a jumper. Uh, uh, no need to pants. provide any more detail. Yeah, that, that's fine. But, but uh, you know, for me, this is perfect. Uh, of course, uh, I, I really like to travel, but, but, you know, there's always two sides. Right. Um, so thank you, Tavi. And then um, uh, I think we're also, we, we, we were just touching um, as we close on some of these slightly maybe more um, strange or even dystopian things that have been happening to our world lately in the industries that we touch. Um, I'm just monitoring some of the questions from our audience. And there's one question uh, to, to Martin Gauss in a similar vein, um, where one of our audience members is asking us, you know, a number of airlines started um, offering these kinds of flights to nowhere, quote unquote, um, that, um, that involve effectively some sightseeing from uh, up in the air. You know, what is your view is uh, on on specifically on these things? Is it is it uh, is it here to stay? You know, uh, what is the or or is that just a super temporary measure to do something uh, unusual? Should we say? Uh, for this, this again, two sides to it. Uh, of course, if there's a demand and we have airplanes, our assets, and we can uh, operate it profitable, uh, it is something useful to do. Because uh, if I take somebody from uh, A to B so to a Greek island and he has a holiday, maybe somebody else wants to see the northern lights and just fly and be back home. Uh, it's a big success in New Zealand. They made even um, uh, something bigger out of it. We tried it here in Latvia. Uh, was not was initially not liked. Then the flight came with beautiful pictures from the flight. People liked it. Uh, it can be a sight a side arm of a business and it can develop looking at the northern lights a lot of people would like to see that and then uh, come back home maybe have a good catering have a nice evening on board of an aircraft uh, it is something which in this pandemic uh, came and maybe it's there to stay but it will be always a niche but uh, we we if there is the demand of course can do that as well does this reconcile with your sustainability objective do you think it's a sustainable way of uh, of, of doing it yeah, I think it is because what we do on sustainability is that uh, we offer um, travel, 
uh, and we do this every year with reduced uh, carbon footprint and, and we have an agenda to become carbon neutral. And uh, while I'm investing in brand new aircraft, I still need to somehow sustain the business. And if I can make a profit by uh, having somebody having a journey, it's a journey, nothing else than the person going to a Greek island. So that journey, that evening, uh, that dinner you have on board to see the Northern Lights with your partner might be actually something very valuable for the customer. So he's willing to do this. We try to uh, uh, use our assets and yeah, the discussion about are you burning more fuel? Um, that is a difficult discussion because then you would question at all, uh, do you need an airline? Um, so I think that the, the, um, the future will tell what people would like to do. We are anyway, as our industry, we are going to be carbon neutral. In 50 years from now, nobody will discuss ever that there was some uh, uh, fuel burned, but we just need to go a little bit further and then flying will be carbon neutral. I'm pretty sure that we will all see that. And we're all looking forward to that, uh, Martin, I'm sure. Um, I think, again, to me, as a, as a strategy professor, I find it absolutely fascinating, the, the creativity that business leaders have um, demonstrated over these past few months. I think there will be plenty of cases written for my students, you know, generations of, of future students of, of strategy and microeconomics to uh, to uh, look at and peruse, you know, from airlines to grocery retail uh, to uh, to all of the other industries that we cover today. I think we're running out of time, uh, but I am tremendously grateful to to all uh, all four of you gentlemen for, for your wonderful insights. You know, I think we come up come out with with great lessons for business leaders in any industry. Uh, you know, on things like digital, on things like sustainability, on things like liquidity, and and sort of pushing your way through uh, through this very tough time. Really appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, uh, I will now hand back to uh, to Andres to maybe give us a closing word. Well, uh, I can only add on to the to the words of gratitude to our uh, really uh, great panelists today. Uh, I know it took a lot of uh, time budgeting on your side to to make this, so uh, that's very much appreciated by the organizer of of this session. Um, I think really the session, uh, at least in my subjective view, really hit the goal. Uh, we wanted to look into very different industries uh, and, and to look for some recipes on, on, on dimensions which uh, to think about for, for the business leaders. And if I have my few cents, uh, although there's still a lot to digest, then, um, then it is about digitalization, sustainable recovery, and, and, and then in the meantime, cost control to, to juggle around. Uh, but uh, and, and another thing, thought that, uh, that came to me is that uh, what, what is another thing that's clear is that uh, there's, there's, there's no turning back to normal. There's, there's simply no, no such thing. It's going to be all different than it was. And it's a matter of uh, finding the recipe for, for each business to, to adopt. So thanks again uh, to all the panelists. I, I hope you also enjoyed this. And, uh, uh, and, and over to the audience. Uh, we're about to have a short break uh, for half an hour. We're meeting again at four o'clock uh, for, uh, for discussing capital availability to, to fuel whatever growth is possible. Uh, there's no growth without capital uh, after all. And uh, in the meantime, what I can suggest uh, for the alumni is to, again, uh, vote on the Alumni Association board. The vote is open until this evening, so you can spend this half an hour doing that. And the other thing, I invite you to become a contributing member of the Alumni Association on Alumni LV. Um, as I said after the previous session, uh, this is a difficult year for fundraising on the association side. So this is a way you can help us to uh, go on to keep our activities going, uh, both on the scholarships and other forms of support to the school. Uh, so see you again in half an hour. Uh, thanks for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you.